Okay, so welcome everyone. <laughs> My name is Katie Wilkinson and I'm the Wilder Communities Team Leader at Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, within the Wilder Communities Team we have Hetty Lewis who is the Wilder Communities Officer who works across Devon and she's here tonight working behind the scenes uh, doing all the techie stuff. Uh, and we also have um, Emily Perriman, who is the next door nature officer, and she has a focus in Exeter. So the Wilder Communities team have organised this winter webinar series focusing on topics to empower community action for nature. And these topics have been put together based on conversations we've been having with communities across Devon. So we really, really hope that they'll be useful um, but we do welcome any feedback about any ideas for future events, anything else you, that you'd like um, like to see. Um, future sessions that we've got coming up uh, are improving school grounds for wildlife. That's coming up in February. And we've also got one on wildlife gardening and that's coming up in March. All the details and how to sign up are on the, on the website devonwildlifetrust.org. Um, So the Wilder Communities team has been set up to support community-led action for wildlife. We want to support and empower people like you to take action for nature where you live, learn or work because, well, you know your community is the best. Um, so we want to support you um, in whatever endeavour you have um, in your communities for, for wildlife and nature. So if you're thinking of running a big event or want to sow wild flowers in your local park, but not sure where to start, or you want to know how to run a bio blitz uh, and anything else in between, we are here to help you. Um, and this webinar series is obviously one way that we are trying to, to support you, uh, but we also offer resources. Um, we have lots more resources coming this year. We can offer online meetings and face-to-face -face meetings to discuss your ideas and see how we can support you and give you advice and guidance. Um, and this year we'll be putting on some training sessions too, so watch this space for those. We aim to develop things in response to what you in communities want. Um, so I'll be sharing contact details for the team at the end of the session, so do get in touch if you um, have any ideas. On top of this, we also want to share and celebrate what you're doing so that others can see the positive impact that you're having and therefore inspire others to, to do the same. And therefore we share and celebrate what they're doing and hopefully inspire more people and so on and so forth. So hopefully we'll create a snowball effect and you know, taking action for wildlife in your community becomes the norm. Basically, that's what we're, that's what we're aiming for. The more people that are taking uh, action for wildlife and nature, the better for both people and wildlife, as I'm sure you know. And we do have a goal at Devon Wildlife Trust to have a quarter of the population actively engaged and doing something for, for wildlife and nature where they live, le learn or work. But this can only be achieved if we all work together. So it's really, really great to, to see you all here tonight. So this is our third event in our winter webinar series. And tonight we have David Curry, who is the Exeter Diocese Environmental Advisor. He also manages the Devon Living Churchyards project and is chair of the Devon Church's Green Action Group. Uh, and we're really, really looking forward to, to him sharing his knowledge and experience with us tonight. And we hope you get a lot out of it. After David, we'll hear from Charlotte and Caroline from the Modbury Wildlife Action Group. Over the last two years, they've been working with St George's Church uh, in Modbury, and they'll be sharing their experience so far with us tonight as well. So hopefully that will be really insightful for you. So before we move on to uh, David's talk, we have a very quick poll question. So like I said, there'll be a pop up box that will appear on your screen. And the question is, what are you currently um, what are you currently doing to welcome wildlife into your churchyard slash burial grounds um, at the moment? So it's a mul multiple choice. So you're not currently involved um, with the churchyard or burial ground. You'd like to take action, but haven't started yet. You'd like to take action, but not sure how to gain permission. 
Um, and then others, I won't read them all out, um, but there's others there as well. And I'll just give you a few moments just to read through that. Okay, answers coming in. Great, so all of you have answered, thank you so much. Um, so by the looks of things, uh, a few of you aren't currently involved. Uh, some of you would like to take action but haven't started yet. Um, a couple of you would like to take action but not sure how to gain permission. Um, five of you have changed mowing regime. Uh, what else? We, a couple of you have planted trees and shrubs and flowers, which is good. Uh, three of you have installed wildlife homes. Five of you have done some recording and surveying. Uh, one of you have got a management plan. Uh, three of you have created a green team or volunteer group. That's really great. And um, a couple of you have involved other members in wildlife activities. Excellent. Really good. That gives us a really good... Um, really good sort of view of, of where, where you're at as a community right now. Um, so thank you for that. So now it's over to the main event, David Curry. So I will stop um, sharing my screen and it's over to you, David. I can't hear you, David. Can anyone else hear David? It looks like you're on mute. Uh, there we go. There we go. Brilliant. Go for it. Okay, there we are. I think churchyards are one of the most underrepresented habitats in the UK. And very little work is being done on churchyards until recently, that is. And for that, it is a very unique habitat. And as you'll see as we go along. When the Christians became, the Celtic Christians came over to this country, they established their churches. And there's an example there of a Saxon church. And around the church, they put a cemetery. No walls, no nothing. They just put in the cemetery around the church. Now, if you look behind the church there, you'll see it's a part of a major piece of countryside. So they just plonk them where they were necessary. Usually they plonk them on a pagan site, and that's an important thing to remember, okay? So there we have, let's call that Heathland. So somebody planted a church and a graveyard on Heathland. Sorry, David, I don't think you're screen sharing at the moment. How's that? That's perfect. All right. <laughs> so there we have the original Saxon church with a graveyard around it. And they were plonked anywhere, literally, um, usually on a pagan site. And that's the important thing to remember. So this church, for instance, was plonked 
on a heathland habitat. Some are plonked on woodlands. They formed a, a glade within the woodlands and put a church there. So that's an important thing to remember. As you can see, there was an area around it called a litty, and that was an acre, and it wasn't a measurement, you know, for a for a square meters or square yards. It was the amount of land a man could plow in one day. And then some king came up in 800 AD and said, you will put walls around your churchyards. So imagine that you are encapsulating all what's in that churchyard. So you've literally um, framed a heathland habitat within that cemetery. And that has remained like that for 800 years. It hasn't been ploughed, it hasn't been sprayed, just the occasional six foot hole dug in it. And that's the whole thing about churchyards. We have this a massive genetic diversity in the ground there, which has been there for hundreds of years, untouched. And that's the value of the churchyard today. Basically, all you're gonna do is let the grass grow long and see what comes up. Well, let's, let's carry on. There are 16,000 16, churches in the UK, and it's near to remember that that's an area the size of a Dartmoor National Park. So that's quite a big area. In Devon, we have over 600 churchyards. Think about it. <laughs> Most of those are rural because we are a rural county. We've got churchyards high up on Dartmoor. This is St. Michael's on Brentor. We have churchyards low down on River Estuaries. This is St. Andrews, their affairs. We have churchyards within the urban context. This is the Unitarian Church and St. Andrews Church as well. So there is a variety of locations. There's also a variety of history and history is an important part of our work. You can see that there, 1563, that church was put in on the orders of Queen Elizabeth I, and it's the church where Sir Francis Drake was married. So there is a historical context as well. And of course, that's very important when you're managing the land. Now, one thing is a churchyard is many things to many people. Some people think that a churchyard is a pleasant, reflective place for the congregation of visitors. Some think that it's an environment in keeping with the function of burial and the scattering of cremated remains. Some think it's a respected and cared for part of our environment. And some think it's a sanctuary for wildlife. That's very important because when you go in and talk to the church community, you have a lot of different opinions of what the churchyard should be and maintain. Obviously, the first thing we see when we walk into a churchyard are the gravestones. And if you're ever teaching children or adults about geology, the best introduction you can give them is a walk around the churchyard, because there you can see the different gravestones made of different types of stone. And you can see the, a good variety there, Scot the pink Scottish granites, Cornish granites, Swedish larvacite, Portland stone, the white Italian marble, and the York stone. Just a little side note about the Italian marble. Some Church of England churches won't allow that within their cemetery because it stinks of the Roman Catholic faith. And that, that, you know, that's true. They won't allow that in there. And black and Italian marble are banned from a, a number of churchyards because of the connotations of the Roman Catholics. This is a church, this is St. Leonard's at Sheep Store, solid granite. And obviously being on the edge of Dartmoor, it's, uh, it's used in local rock. And just up the road around the corner is a St. Leonard's Holy Well, which is another important aspect. So when I was talking about churches, churches being built on pagan sites, you have a, in this case here. So before there was a church, there was a pagan holy well where the pagans held their ceremonies. And then when the site was Christianized, 
they built the church as close as or on top of the pagan site. Here we're looking at Buckfast Abbey geology. Blue limestone quarry locally, so that's easy enough. But Ham Hill stone from Somerset. So the beginning of the century, they had to transport this Ham stone from Somerset to Buckfast Lee. Inside, Purbeck limestone quarried in Purbeck in Dorset, that beautiful, creamy, very, very smooth, fine grained limestone. So don't forget the geology when you go into churchyards. It's very important. I worked in St Albans for 25 years and um, St Albans Abbey. And around the base of the abbey were these big boulders of a rock called a pudding stone. You can see it looks like a plum pudding there. Pudding stones had a lot of connotations about myths and legends, especially about witches. And 13 of these boulders are placed around the foundations of the abbey to keep away the witches from the abbey. Again, it's just geology, but such a lot of stories to tell. I mean, here in some of the churches, you see these lovely pillars in East Devon, and you can see the type of stone there. Um, some was desert, some were rivers, 250 million years old, Permian sandstone, and beer stone, 120 million years old. And this is a very interesting stone. This stone was at St. Peter's Church in St. Albans, one of the biggest churchyards I've managed. It was three acres in size. And somebody had the money in the Victorian times and the note to transport this Precambrian granite from Canada to this country. And that granite is 4.6 billion years old. I passed it by several times without beginning to realize what it was. So there you've seen that we've got this lovely aspect of geology, but that geology also dictates what's going to grow on it. If it's acid rock, you'll get the acid loving plants. If it's an alkaline rock, you'll get the alkaline loving plants. And this refers especially to lichens. Just looking at that slide, you can see many, many types of lichen. There's an average of 40 species of lichen in each churchyard. And then last year we did a, a lichen survey and uh, Ken, St Andrews, 149 species, several of which were actually very rare indeed and very important species. And here we've got a problem. You see on that left stone, along comes the historians who want to do a catalogue, if you like, of the, or um, an archive of the people buried in the graveyard. And of course that covers all of the writing. So what they do is they get their bucket and hard brush and they brush off all the lichens so they can read the lettering. That's happened a number of times in our churches. So what is a lichen? This is a, a very common lichen we find all over the place. But it's an organism made of a fungus, which gives the body, and the algae, which gives the green color and the other colors. So there are two organisms living there in a symbiotic relationship. And a lovely thing to, I mean, just give somebody, an, uh, just walk around the churchyard with a magnifying glass and just have a look at those lichens. <clears throat> Is this your churchyard? <laughs> Thumbs down for that one. Or is it like this? Curious Marjorie Church in Tiverton, where they've actually managed their grass cutting regime. I'll say more about that later on. Yew trees, very significant in churchyards. Um, and you can find most of the Europe's yew trees in English churchyards. Very, very ancient yew trees. Some of the trees were there before the church was there. Take, for example, Heavy Tree in Exeter, that little town on the edge of Exeter called Heavy Tree. And if you go to the church near the south entrance, you'll find a very, very old yew tree. That yew tree was there before 
a church was built, and that yew tree was a center of pagan worship. And that yew tree was a very heavy tree, hence the name for the area, Hebe tree. <coughs> <coughs> Wax cap fungi, again, an indicator species, which are found in unimproved and undisturbed pastures. So if you go into a churchyard and you also, when you find those, you've got an indication there that that churchyard was built on an unimproved and undisturbed pasture. So goodness knows what genetic gene bank there was within that. And of course, you'll get many other different types of fungi as well throughout the churchyard. Ideal places for bumblebees to find nests and food. Here's a little fact. If bees were paid a minimum wage, a jar of honey would cost £206,000. <laughs> <clears throat> These are colleagues in North Norfolk who have set up a bee colony within the churchyard. And of course, from the bees, you get products, honey, wax, and so on, which the church can sell. And there's one of my local churches in Plymouth who have got two beehives managed by the local beekeeper. And it's using the natural history of the churchyard and surrounding land as a foraging area for those bees. You've all known about the decline in bees, pollinators is now turning into a crisis and it is urgent that we supply them with alternative homes. And there you can see one on the left, a sort of homemade version there on the right, you can buy a, a commercial version as well. And this is something which many people neglect, and that's the sandy banks. A lot of your paths go around churchyards or sunken pathways. And if you look up to the either side, if you scrape away that vegetation there where that soil is red to expose that red soil, that'll be colonized by um, mason bees, mining bees, and so on. So even slopes, sides in a churchyard are valuable for bees. And if you look there, you can just see little pencil-sized holes going into the slope. And the wasp, of course, the carnivore, the wasp is a carnivore, which feeds on all sorts of things. But look at this nest, literally made of paper. It goes to a tree, chews the bark, chews the wind off a tree, and then sort of like a tube of toothpaste or a tube of glue to build that fantastic structure. So we're part of the, De of the Get Devon buzzing scheme, raising awareness, the importance of pollinators, bees, wasps, it's not just bees, it's wasps, hoverflies, butterflies, and all sorts of beetles as well. And we're also working with bug life to create bee lines. Bee lines are linear pathways running through our countryside, which will join up into a UK wide network, helping to conserve our insect pollinators and let them move around more easily. And there's our bee lines in South Devon. Those have been established on maps by Bug Life. And I am currently working with Bug Life and South Devon Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. The yellowy color is this AONB. And you'll see there are green crosses. Those are churches within that A and B churchyard. So what I'm doing is I'm starting from the left, which is Wembry, and gradually working my way along the coast, hoping eventually to end up at Brixham. And we'll visit each churchyard and make recommendations how best they can improve pollinators within that churchyard. We're recording those churchyards hotspots. So we have those bee lines, churches, pollinator plan, which I'm working on now. There's a hotspot church. This is the Leonard's again, which are very their grass cutting regime. Some bits they cut once a year, some bits three times a year, and so on and so forth. And the wildlife improves dramatically when you just vary your grass cutting regime.
I, this is a, a, a thing which I had in my audience a couple of months ago, two Americans were over here on a holiday and they saw that and their main job in their garden was to keep away the dandelions. And so they saw that and they suddenly realized just how valuable dandelions were. And they said to me, they're gonna go back and, and leave the uh, dandelions in the future. St Andrew's Church, Beer Fairs, as you can see there, they let the grass grow to let the flowers low. They've planted rowan trees, cherry trees, and other trees around as well, crab apples. That's the way a churchyard should look. Butterflies are another important aspect of churchyards. Two thirds of our species are in decline, so they need as much help as possible. I mean, you can buy these little commercial butterfly houses and butterfly feeding stations and so on. And when I was at Throwley last year, there was some lovely chimney sweeper moths flying around in the uh, wildflower mixture. Is an interesting feature. A number of churchyards have them, a number of churchyards haven't. Um, we had a, a letter from an elderly gentleman who found an ant's nest taking over a child's grave. He got very, very upset and started um, throwing tins of ant powder all over it to destroy it, and little realizing that most of the ant's nest is underground and not on the surface. I managed to persuade him to stop <laughs> throwing the ant powder over it. Um, but see how many ants nests you've got in your churchyards because they again are indicator species they indicate old meadowland old grassland we've lost as we know most of our whole hay, hay meadows richer wildflowers butterflies and insects and they've all been lost since the second world war due to the application of fertilizers and herbicides And again, I confirm that the grassland is the most important habitat, as often they are the last refuge in the parish for the species that they support. One of the churches I visited was the St. John's Baptist, St. John the Baptist Church in Hatherley. And there you can see what they did was, well, you can't cut, you can't let the grass grow long if there are people visiting relatives' graves. So the church did a survey. They went around the graveyard and determined which were being visited frequently and which were not. And you can see you have two distinct areas there. Orange, where the graves are currently visited, and blue, where the graves are you know, very, very old and nobody visits them. And that's a good definitive plan because then they can determine how they're going to manage the rest of their grassland. So obviously, in the orange area, they keep that down to a, clean, a very close sward, so that it allows people into the graves area. In some areas they've left, and there you can see the lovely oxide daisy plants there. And here you have a, a large gang of volunteers who've cut the grass by hand using scythes. And then they've actually raked it up. And it is very important to remove the grass after cutting. On a smaller scale, St. Leonard's Church sheep store again. Some of it closely mown, some of it not so closely mown. Not enough room to put pollinators in, while well, we can use garden containers to plant in various pollinators plants. Um, this will give the nectar uh, which is needed. Um, so there's no excuse. <laughs> but here's another thing which I, I sort of thought about a couple of years ago, creating a mini meadow. You'll notice around those graves, the grass is cut to an inch of its life. That's the policy of the church and you ain't gonna change it. But you can create mini meadows. And there we can see a a grave, which is called a curb grave. 
and usually they've got a load of weeds and rubbish growing on them or gravel. And what I've suggested is that we scrape off the green from the top of that grave, leaving exposed that soil. And then you scatter your wildflowers over that soil and stamp it down, just walk over it and clamp it down and let nature do the rest. So you're satisfying those who demand short grass, and there are a lot of them, but also at the same time, you've created these little mini, mini meadows throughout the churchyard. Slow worms, you can do a bit for slow worms, especially, especially amongst the old gravestones and uh, the tombs which are around, they found them there in the shades. So that's a good site where you can find them. Swifts, they arrive in May, well, they should do, after flying 3,100 miles. They feed in on insects, and you can look at that picture there, and you can see that big lump under its throat, the bolus. That's a great lump of insects, which they've been catching in flight. Spend most of that time entirely on the wing, and even feed, sleep, and mate in flight. And a lot of them will actually use church towers to nest in and looking up above the clock there, you can see that grilled window there. Most of them now have been closed up because of the jackdaws invading the inside of the tower. What we're trying to persuade them is to unblock them and put in swift next boxes behind that grating there. You can do it on a small scale, you can put little swift nest boxes. Um, under the eaves of windows or churchyards or church hall or something like that. Or like this one, this is St Albans Abbey. I found that they were actually doing work on the roof. So while they were up there, we installed three swift nest boxes just under the eaves there. And even got the archdeacon to say a prayer over the uh, nest boxes. And they've been nesting very successfully since. Or we can be like again, St. Peter's, St. Sorry, St. John the Baptist at Haverley. And um, there's a set of drawings which you can use for the design of these nest boxes. And the, the carpen local carpenter has built like a huge area of nest boxes there. And uh, they've been working with the RSPB on that. And that was finished 18 months ago. One church has gone one step further. Shudley, and they've put in recordings of swifts, and which just seem to attract swifts flying around, and they come in and find the nest boxes and begin to nest through themselves. And this is relatively new, the S brick, a solution for swifts. Very good idea. The council in Hove on the south coast actually demands that all new housing development now will have at least three S bricks in their house. That's a part of the planning regulations. There you are, and there's the little cavity with a nest with the um, swifts peeking through. Also in the south porch, south facing porch of churches, you often get swallows up in the roof of that little porch, which is fine. This is what we'd like to see. But this is not what we'd like to see. Because when the birds come, the rubbish, um, which go all over the floor, which is usually the main entrance to the church, and the solution is on the right, so put a bracket there to catch the droppings. Again, I go back to St. Leonard's. There's a lovely little notice there. You say, well, they've stopped the swallows from going into the south porch, which they've been doing for decades. And if you look carefully, you can see on the top of the gates, so there's a big enough cavity for the swallows to fly through and continue nesting without disturbance. <coughs> Churchyards are very devoid of flowers of any kind. 
So we try to encourage churches to plant as many different types of flowers as they can. This is a site we would like to see in our churches. If you've got a little uniform group or a school group, um, you can put in a raised bed, which they can adopt. And um, they've got the little raised bed there, and it's called a Be Happy. And they've planted um, pollinator plants, which will attract the pollinator species. Many churches, especially the older churches, have got daffodils and crocuses growing there. And we always just take them for granted. What we don't realize is many times that some of these are very, very old varieties, no longer available. So before you start thinking about, oh, we've got too many daffodils or whatever, check your varieties to see what you've got there, because you may have some heritage species there. Microhabitats. I'll just go over that very quickly, very important in church arts. Veteran trees. There are some churches you will get, apart from the yew tree, you also get some very, very old trees, which we call veteran trees. If you look at the bottom line, there are 1800 species of invertebrates can be found on a single veteran tree. Now, trees, like anything, have a specific lifespan. People think that veteran trees are just going to live forever. They don't. Ash trees are quite common within churchyards, and I've seen some beautiful veteran ash trees in, in, up in Harpenshire. But of course, we've got ash dieback. And it's going to wipe out practically every ash in the country within the next decade. Hopefully you will find a variety of ash which is actually immune. But so far, we haven't been all that successful. What I, what I do say is, if there you have a very, very large ash tree, it doesn't mean to say you need to cut it down. Just cut away the offending branch and burn it because the rest of the ash tree will survive quite well. And that's the sort of damage you can see on the ash tree. That needs cutting down because that is unsafe. And that is the only reason that I would cut down ash wood, is that it's unsafe. This is a church I worked in, St. Peter's in St. Albans, 13th century. Here's a sketch of that church, 13th century. And here's my photograph. 2012. On the left top side there you have a huge horse chestnut and then in front of the church tower there you have a cedar, a Lebanon cedar, which is past its sell-by date and very very large branches are beginning to drop. In the late 18th century a vicar went across to the Holy Land to do his pilgrimage and he saw the Lebanon trees, the Lebanon cedars growing there. So he thought he'd bring back some seeds and seedlings. And within a couple hundred years, practically every churchyard had a Lebanon cedar in it. So all of these Lebanon cedars are all about the same age, and they're all now beginning to die. Yeah, this one especially, where the lower branches just drop, and they are very large lower branches. And to the right, a very tall tree is a twin stemmed. Douglas fir. It was. We'll see more about that later. So for planning, we got some money to buy a new cedar tree. I mean, I sort of stepped 50 paces out from the old cedar tree, dug a pit and planted this new cedar tree on the left. That tree, by the way, cost 300 quid. So we had to go and ask for donations for that tree. And that's that tree today. That was 10 years ago. And you can just see behind it, the um, bare branches of the other cedar as it's gradually dying off. 
information is so important. Communication is so important. And please remember when you're doing work to let people know that you're doing work, but please don't type out a sheet, put it into a plastic wallet and stick it on a piece of hardboard. It looks disgusting. Um, spend the money, or if you can't spend the money, um, apply for some. And there you can see a part of a church garden. This is that St. Peter's Church, where you call that lovely, that panel costs 700 quid, but it's, so it's light proof, burglar proof, and every other proof you can think of. And it's guaranteed to last 25 years. Uh, behind that, you'll see a, an obelisk with a maze around it. And then further up the site, you'll see a sculpture there, which we'll see later. Here's Holy Tree. Holy Tree is another church or tree because of the red berry signifying the red blood of Christ. Um, some of those holy trees are very, very old indeed, so they, they must be preserved within that churchyard. I had a distress call from a church, which will remain nameless in Mid-Devon, where somebody decided to take it upon themselves to actually cut down the holly trees because they were shading out the light from the windows. We managed to stop it, thank goodness. And of course, bird life in churchyards is also worth study. Spotted flycatcher. Have you ever been up a park or some fields and you see this little brown job fly out from the hedgerow, goes like 50 yards, grabs it in a second, flies back again? It's probably a spotted flycatcher. So we've been working with the Devon Birds Nest Box scheme to install flycatcher nest boxes around the southern borders of Dartmoor. And sometimes when you've got local volunteers, they can be used to, to help build nest boxes for you. Church towers are also a good place for looking, you know, if you look up, you may see a sparrow hawk or a peregrine falcon just on the top of the tower scanning the ground beneath looking for its prey and there we've found one who's just eaten a pigeon for his lunch. The RSPB have done some very good schemes with their cathedrals where they've actually established and installed nest platforms and also TV cameras as well. Again it's information, communication, mammals, as you can see Badgers. Oh, that's very nice, but badgers have an inclination to dig up things, so you have to be very careful with that. That's happened a few times with me, both in Harvestshire and in Devon. Hedgehogs, of course, are very important. And there is a top predator, the moggy. Unfortunately, some bats do go actually inside the church and the vicar will walk in one Sunday morning and find a great row of bat droppings along the floor where a bat colony had decided to establish itself right up on the top of the roof of the church. Bats are protected by law and there's not much you can do about it. But here you can see 6,000 churches, churchyards throughout the UK where bats have been recorded. <clears throat> We can do bat walks, bat surveys, so we can visit your churchyard. Devon Wildlife Trust have their own bat detecting quit, which you leave out overnight, and they will actually identify the bats and record the bats for you. So the next morning, you can actually take out the USB and put it on your computer and see what's been around. But bat surveys are quite easy to do, and bat walks are very interesting. Different types of owl, of course. And the best thing for those are nest boxes. So where you've got the trees installed the owl nest boxes. Churchyards create learning opportunities. You can see there. <clears throat> so 
So, I mean, a lot of churches, especially the rural churches, have got a school next to it. So please, please, please involve the local schools. David, you see, now you've got five minutes. Right, thank you. All right. Um, communities, local communities, involve your local community. Don't keep it to yourself. Invite your community in, give them coffee, take them around and say, we need some daffodils planting. And that, that walk between the gates and the south porch, plant hundreds of daffodils and spring bulbs. Count on Nature Week in June. Get people in to count and record the wildlife in your churchyard. Grass cutting. And even on a small scale, this is a St. Anne's church in Glenholt, a tiny garden. And yet, just by letting the grass grow, putting in wildflower seeds, and just mowing down an area, they can provide habitat for many different types of pollinator species. Some churchyards have actually employed sheep to actually cut the grass from them. <laughs> There's something here too which is important. You can open churchyards and close churchyards. Closed churchyards are those which are filled now with burials and can't take any more burials. And the management of that churchyard automatically goes over to the local authority. <laughs> Sorry. I found a number of springs in some churchyards, and that was probably the pagan origin of that church. Because as you know, you go to the North Country there when you have all these springs and wells, and they have well dressing ceremonies during the May time. Again, children's work, schools work, providing habitats for insects, pollinators, compost bins. <coughs> The seeds for that yew were planted, taken from an ancient yew tree, 2,000 years old. Storytelling, very, very important. Next month, they have, it's so important, in fact, there is a storytelling week next month. Have a look on the website. And in most churchyards I've been, I've been trying to get them to establish storyteller seats on the right-hand side. Did you remember that uh, big Douglas fir? The dull stem, it fell over in gales. What should we do? So I said, Well, get somebody who's a craftsman. And he actually built this lovely seat here. And on the left as well, we had this commission, this seat with the lovely owl and the badger and the little squirrel across the back there. Art, is, art has a place in the churchyard in whatever form. <clears throat> Tree of Life, this is done by a sculptor student from Harpshire University's Faculty of Art. I gave them a brief and this is what they came up with. So instead of putting slabs of stone all over your churchyard for cremated remains, if you throw out a space, then here's an alternative. Each of those leaves is a dedication to a relative. So they replace the slabs of stone which would have normally been in the ground. And that lovely bench again. And there's the orchard. I mean, I planted that 2012 um, as supple as tiny two year old whips. And they've come up lovely now. And somebody came up to me and said, but you don't have orchards in churchyards. And I say, you do now. Celebrating Churchyards Week, first week in June. Please remember that. Open your gates. Let people in. Give them coffee. Give them biscuits. Give them guided walks. Give them magnifying glasses to have a look at the, the lichens and so on. Nice book there, Earth to Earth by Stefan Buzaki. Do something small, be part of something big. From feeding birds, nest boxes, to planting wildflower seed, maintaining ancient trees and planting new trees, to leading health walks. It's a partnership. Many people are concerned. 
And there you can see the Diocese of Exeter, Devon Wildlife Trust, Caring for God's Acre. That is a lovely website, Caring for God's Acre. And I do recommend that you visit that site because they have so many resources. I just cannot keep up with it. But if you ever needed some information, Caring for God's Acre is your place. Get them in Buzzing Scheme in the South Devon AOMB. And as I said, do something small, be part of something big. Thank you. Thank you, David. Silent round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. That was uh, that was really good. Um, particularly liked your intro about the geology. It's <laughs> often, you know, you, you often forget, don't you, that, that you, you see the gravestones, but you forget that they're actually rocks from the earth, you know, yes, and actually there's yes. different types and the lichens will grow in it um, as a natural habitat. So, yeah, and I'm definitely going to go and see that yew tree in, in Heavy Tree. Definitely. And uh, that that lovely leaf globe, if you like. Um, yeah, the tree of life. Yeah, that is that is stunning, isn't it? Really yeah. good idea to space save as well, isn't it? Yeah, really great. It's good to and use, then on, use the old local art college. Yeah, good idea. Ex yeah, exactly. Some really great ideas in there and inspiration around, you know, uh, attracting wildlife to the churchyards, you know, particularly around the swifts and um, and things. So, <laughs> yeah, really so much to digest there. Um, so thank you so much, David. I'm going to yeah. hand over now to uh, Charlotte of the uh, Modbury Wildlife Action Group. So we'll get straight on to it and then we'll come to the to Q&A afterwards. Please do put your questions in the chat box um, or feel free to um, you know, raise, raise your hand after uh, Charlotte's spoken. So thank you, over to you, Charlotte. Great, hi, can you, can you hear me all right? Yep, can hear you. Good, good. Uh, well, th thanks very much, David. Um, we're from, uh, and I'm speaking with uh, Caroline Bauer as well, who I think is in, in the audience or whatever you call the, the group of people listening. Um, yeah, thank you, David. That's, it's, it's really great. We really uh, would uh, recommend any, anybody who hasn't had a visit from David uh, do have a visit. Uh, we had one in Modbury uh, in summer 2021, uh, which has gone on to help inform what we're doing. So we are um, a Modbury Wildlife Action Group, and we have been running for about three years, involved in a number of different projects in Modbury. Uh, we've been uh, running for uh, about two years, involved with the uh, PCC uh, at St George's. Um, and we were inspired to help improve biodiversity here after seeing the primroses, which you can see in this slide, being mown in full flower. So we're very lucky. We have a beautiful churchyard already, and in the springtime, uh, very biodiverse. But it was heartbreaking for many of us to see these being mown in late April, uh, which was just a few weeks too early. So we went to the, uh, the, the PCC to talk to them. And uh, I will... Uh, now go on to talk about the aims of our group. Um, and just before I do, I should say that uh, we are a group of volunteers. Uh, there are around 10 of us and we are, have responsibility. Uh, we're vo volunteers, obviously, for different projects. And um, I, I'm leading this, this one, but with a, a whole number of, of, of other people. So the aims which we list, list here in front of us um, have evolved, I think that's quite important to say, with the project as we have understood and learnt from our surveys, the churchyard itself and the PCC. This is a, a very much a learning process for anybody who hasn't done it before. So just going briefly through this, um, the, our aims are to improve biodiversity in the churchyard over the medium to long term and help make it a more vibrant, 
visually and ecologically interesting place where the primroses are not mown whilst in flower. To help the churchyard become more interesting and aesthetically pleasing, with neat mown edges to set off the wilder areas uh, beyond. We would like to do as much as we can within the limitations of a much visited churchyard, but have no set goals. Any small step is seen as an achievement and approach the project slowly, step by step. To inspire and educate the community about the importance of wildlife, really, really important in this day and age. To inspire the local community of all ages to be involved, to engage and to enjoy the churchyard is a public space. To work alongside and always check with the parochial church council what, when and where we can survey, so let grow. We do not want to upset anybody. We are a small community. So in some of the photographs below, you will see we've had um, had great times with the cubs, with the scouts here, um, learning how to use a sweet net and magnifying glass. We have done notices and I totally agree with David about the importance of, I think it's really about good design. Ours are well designed, but they're quite cheap and cheerful. We haven't spent 700 pounds on this. Um, a, a member of the PCC made it for us. Um, and of course, this is um, just a notice telling the public about what we're doing in our little survey area. So it will be being moved around to different places at different years. And I gather it's going to be renewed uh, this winter. So there is an occasion where you just do a temporary sign. At the end of each summer, for the last two summers, we've done a report, we've uh, blow up those pages and we put them in the church so everybody can see what we've been doing. Likewise, over the summer, uh, we've, I must admit we forgot last summer, but the summer before, we had a large blackboard in the church porch uh, again, explaining what we were doing and what we'd seen on a sort of monthly basis. And of course, uh, the, the next photograph shows that we, we all get to with our dumpy bags and our rakes and our spades uh, and help. So the, after the aims, the objectives. We're citizen scientists. Our approach was one of partial ignorance. And we knew it was vital to talk to the PCC before doing anything. The churchyard is one and a half acres in size and has two very popular public footpaths running through it. And since the PCC is responsible for the area, we knew that we needed to take a sensitive and diplomatic approach, reflecting the important place the churchyard has within the community. We suggested we could do a small wildlife survey in an older, less visible and less used part of the churchyard as a start. We had no illusions that we would achieve much and that if we did, it may take five or more years. So this in front of you is the image. Um, uh, we drew a map. Uh, I'm a landscape architect, so um, that's quite easy for me, but it doesn't have to be uh, drawn with computer. It could be drawn by hand using uh, Google Aerial, but it's really important to know what the tree species are, know what your hedges are made up of. And the, uh, the hexagonal uh, red uh, shape shows the survey area 2021, which is in the shady, now not so shady, because unfortunately the ash trees are dying of ash dieback and have been pollarded back, so it'll be a bit sunny now. And the photograph on the top right shows what that's like. So it is, it is very, very beautiful uh, until the primroses are mown down. But hopefully they won't be. They haven't been for two years, which is very exciting. And then last summer, we had the survey area 2022, which is the more triangular red shape, uh, which is the photograph in the bottom left-hand corner, which is much, much grassier and much sunnier. So, 
for the for, for the survey each person on our team chose a different species group to survey and we did monthly surveys from april to september in our own time we wrote up our findings in the autumn of 2021 for our shady area it is very useful having team members who already know something about wildlife can draw, design, or use are used to computers and writing reports, and that everyone was happy and is happy to learn how to identify species they knew nothing about previously. We presented this report to the PCC, suggesting recommendations and requested that we could do, we requested that we could do an additional survey in summer 2022 in a sunnier spot. This we did last summer in the um, triangular area. So here is the summary of our findings for the 2022 survey. It is important that this is clear and understandable to members of the public. For example, a cartoon section seen at the bottom of the slide helps to explain the difference in species diversity between mown and non-mown areas. This year, we also talked about the vital interrelationship of flowering grasses and butterflies, thanks to a member of our group who knows about butterflies, as David has touched on too. A lot of people don't think grasses are very interesting or very important, uh, but of course they are. This is not simply about numbers of species, it is about habitat ecology. We have learned what is in each area, but until we change management practices and do further surveys over more summer seasons, we are unlikely to notice any specific differences since our involvement. We like to think that we have helped inspire the PCC, who have been keen to help us and consequently now we have a very good relationship with them. So we've, we've got lists of species on the left hand side. Uh, we have photographs. We don't know who's going to be reading this. So it's, as I say, it's very important that it's um, available to everybody. So having written the report, we were in an informed position to recommend a way forward. We have talked informally to the PCC about these ideas. And thanks to advice from local wildlife and ecology experts, we can advise the PCC what course of management would be best to improve biodiversity. So here on the on the left hand side, you can see um, just very briefly, and this this should go with a map as well to make it kind of easier to understand. I think uh, we've got most of the churchyard to cut as normal, the survey area 2021. What to do with that in terms of um, planting, sowing, sowing more. Uh, cutting regime, clearance of unsightly docks, just thinking about what thing places look like and feel like all through the, the season is really important. And then the survey area 2022, likewise, which is very different, so requires a very different approach. Um, we've been sowing yellow rattle, for instance, this winter, uh, and if funding allows, we'll be sowing some rather late perennial wildflower seeds too, to improve the biodiversity there. Though, of course, without getting rid of all that uh, precious grass. So, and then, and then, yes, yeah, sorry, on the bottom right, we have um, ideas that uh, David came up with in his report that he did for us uh, a year and a half ago. Um, we have some bee, a keen beekeeper who actually lives next door to the church. So um, that's one idea. We should go and approach him to see whether they would like to put a beehive in the churchyard, uh, planting biblical herbs amongst the memorial plaques. So these are uh, ideas, some of which we've done. We've installed bird boxes, for instance but ideas to talk about with the PCC as we go forward, um, as the years go by. So we don't feel as though we have to do everything now. Um, it's, I think it's very important to, to just do things, as we said, slowly, slowly. 
So um, this is the last slide, and this is simply the lessons for, for others. Um, after two, two seasons of small scale ecological surveys aimed to improve biodiversity. So things to think about if you haven't done this before. How many people on your green team? What are their skills? Make use of them <laughs> if they would like to use them. Are they keen to learn, keen to share? Most importantly, probably their energy levels. Strimming, seeding, bulb planting, weeding, removing cuttings. It, it all, it's quite physical. Um, we do tend to do small one hour sessions, two hour sessions with coffee, biscuits. Um, it, it wants to be fun, very important to be fun. Four, slowly, slowly. Individuals in the PCC or general community can decide they dislike long grass and make life very difficult. So we are always treading carefully and every churchyard and every PCC is different. So there's no, <laughs> there's no kind of standard, unfortunately, to follow. Important to understand the churchyard, the age of the graves, the trees, the edges of your churchyard, what they are, are they safe? Um, make the most of them, celebrate them, and the most frequented areas. Where do the paths go? Where do people go off the paths? Seven, important to communicate and understand the PCC and what their interests and concerns might be. Also to understand and communicate well with the landscape contractors and gardeners who normally cut the grass. This is really, really important um, we found that, of course, the PCC have been um, uh, asking the, the landscape contractors who are also part of the PCC in Modbury uh, to, to cut the grass at certain times. Um, we, this, this coming year, uh, they've said that we can talk to our garden contractors uh, for the church, which I think will be very helpful because mistakes and misunderstandings are very easy to ha happen. Um, eight, start with a small area. Better to do that well than be over ambitious, lose enthusiasm and energy and end up with an unhappy mess. And I'm talking about people mess as much as um, a churchyard mess. Nine, appreciate that all humans have a need for neatness and control and that mown path edges are important. There is a tendency within our uh, our green um, movement and our teams that wild is fantastic. And of course it is, but I think um, psychologically we do need to control things. There is a, a need for neatness and some people have it much more than others and we need to take, take that and respect it. And finally, diplomacy is all <laughs> gently, gently, and uh, you'll catch a monkey, so to speak. Um, Good luck to everybody, and it's it's a wonderful learning process. Uh, I think we've all learned a lot in Modbury, um, and we will go forward and hopefully increase the number of butterflies and insects little bit by little bit, year on year. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was really good. Silent round of applause again. <laughs> uh, thank you. No, that was uh, really good to hear your experience, and I hope others in the in the in the webinar, um, yeah, have have taken something from that. I think you're right. I think it's really important to you know start small and build and build it slowly, because you are changing something after all, and sometimes people need to get used to that. Yeah. So it's good to just start slow, build, build slowly so that people get used to the idea that actually the churchyard may look a bit different mm. going forward. Um, yeah, really good. Um, we are, are going to move into to Q&A session now. Um, and then at the end, I think we'll do the poll question, Hetty, if that's all right. Um, I have a quick question for you, actually. Charlotte, I wondered about, um, and Caroline, if she's on, on the call, I, I just wondered about funding. So 
you know, there was pictures there of, you know, sweep nets and, and things and, you know, there's printing even. Mm. I just wondered how you, mm. um, how you fund that. Have you, is the church giving funds or are you kind of uh, doing funding bids, you know, small funding bids together to get some money? Mm. That's, that's a very good question. Um, and do, do jump in, um, Caroline, too. Uh, yeah, at the moment, the, the, the sweep net, um, that, that is mine. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of being donated uh, by individuals, but we do have now a, a small lump of money uh, that the parish council are donating to Modwag this coming year and we do intend to buy and we have actually with in the past with smaller amounts of money bought wildflower seeds uh, the yellow rattle uh, and i do hope to to buy one or two more sweep nets so that we can that'll be make it easier to um have have good engagement with with children and adults uh, for for wildlife uh, yeah it's you just hope that um we're uh, I th I'd like to think that we've kind of pushed our head ourselves in a very in this tiny way, which means our expenses are quite small too. And certainly, the parish council seem to think that we're doing good stuff, so have given yeah. us several hundred pounds. Um, right. Yeah. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, um, Caroline. I think I'm still on mute. Am I? No, no we, we can hear you. you. Me. Oh, OK, because on my screen it says I'm still muted. Um, as far as funding is concerned and where we've got it from, do you mean? Sorry, um, Katie. Yeah, well, how we've managed so far uh, without any form. We certainly haven't done any, uh, don't think we've done any grant applications or anything, have we? What? No, but we actually we haven't spent a great deal of money either. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Most of it has been uh, voluntary work um, that we've done in there and involving local groups. And we haven't done a vast amount of anything because we've been busy surveying um, and working and communicating rather than actually doing, which I think is something that we are very aware of. And, and there's a great, uh, I think for, for most people who are, who are enthusiastic and have lots of energy, there's a great sort of impulse to get in there and do something. But I think it's really important to work with nature and also to work with, um, you know, the local group, uh, the, the church group, as, as Charlotte's already pointed out uh, very clearly, um, not to rush in and um, find out what's there first before you start doing anything more. So we, ha we haven't actually needed to spend much money. Um, we did, we have bought the sweep nets and bits and pieces, but I mean, it hasn't been a lot. And that most of that's come through the parish council, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, which, which is really good, isn't it? That you haven't, you haven't spent much money, but lots has been done because you've pulled on the expertise of the group, you know, people have been willing to share their skills, share their time. And it's amazing, you know, how much you can get done with, you know, on a shoestring or without even spending a penny, um, which, you, yeah. you know, will be also music to, you know, the church's ears as well. So <laughs> I would imagine, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Did you want to add something, David? Yeah. I don't I'm currently, in a, I'm, if you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm currently working on that very thing because I'm saying to churches to have some decent notice boards at the entrance of the gate to say what they're doing. They will even provide the text for it. But those boards are very expensive. You want them to last. So what I'm doing is I'm negotiating some funding to buy bulk orders of notice boards, like 20, sort of 5,000, 10,000 quids worth, whatever. So that churches can then have their own notice board. Um, so I'm not, and also I'm looking for say 250 pound startup grants for churches as well um, to pay for things like boards, seeds, trowels, forks, bulbs, whatever. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. First of all, see if we can get a, a large lump sum to give out 250 pound startup grants but also a largest fund is also to buy notice boards in bulk. 
these would be good notice boards are made of wood, they're made of oak, um, and waterproof, weatherproof. And um, so, yeah, that's where I am at the moment. Well, Excellent. Uh, can I just butt in, uh, David? I just just thinking about what I was saying about <laughs> uh, the little notice board that we we have, and we have yeah. about five of them around the, the the survey areas. Would you advise that it it might be wise just to hold off and not not have a really smart notice board until five years or something into doing a uh, improving in biodiversity uh, because people check the members of the PCC change the members of the the green group will change and it might all fall apart in after three years and you'll have got this very smart notice board which will be rather out of date by then possibly yeah but we can take the notice board out and recycle it and give it to somebody else <laughs> don't we really but yeah, that's what I'm working um, on. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I there's a couple of questions that are coming through on the chat, if you don't mind, because I'm just aware of time and I want to yes, make yes, sure that um, people have had their questions answered. So okay. I'm going to direct this one to David. Um, so what are your thoughts to introducing new species by sowing and planting that would otherwise not have been there? Should we be preserving slash encouraging back the natural habitat that would naturally be there at the churchyard? Are we damaging a precious ancient habitat by say, sowing an annual wildflower meadow? meadow? Right, That's yeah. Question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think the first thing to do is to stop the grass cutting regime to see what comes up. And that yeah. will give you an idea then of what's in the seed bank. And then you can then collect seed at the end of the growing season. And then you know, sort of reseed some of the areas, but for things like mini meadows or small patches, um, you need to get a, a very good standard UK BAM sourced seed from somewhere like Emmersgate or you know a very good seed merchant. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's a good. I, I think that's a good idea about seeing what you've got after a mowing regime has changed you know seeing it through a whole season and then and then you know basically yeah seed spreading from from that i think that's that's probably the you know really good good way of avoiding perhaps introducing something that you know may not have been there i guess it's also a a kind of preference in terms of you know what the church wants and and perhaps what even you know the local community want or congregation want so I guess it's a it's a balance isn't it but you know I'd probably advocate that you know it is perhaps best to plant what's already you know reseed seed and plant what's already there rather than introducing you know a, a, a mix that perhaps might not even do so well in, in the soils there as well so it's just being yeah it's just being sensitive isn't it to, to yes. the habitats yeah. there yeah. it's just being sensitive um, another say, question uh, oh well, sorry David. well i just want to say the don't focus on the pcc too much because they are usually a pain in the butt <laughs> i'm no, sorry I, I disagree with that okay fair <laughs> enough um it really does i would imagine they're all I would all go different. to the church, go get make friends with a church warden and do it through the <laughs> church warden. And that's why I'm working at the moment. They're the yeah. people with influence. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you only need one or two or three naysayers in your PCC and you've lost the battle. I, I would, in my experience, working with um, either directly with, with the um, vicar or, you know, whoever um is at the church or the church warden uh, i've worked with church wardens before and yeah they're really great at, at making things you know move if you like um <laughs> so they're they're really good another question has come in um uh, it's directed at my team actually can wilder communities help with surveys and information sessions uh, I'm not sure what information <laughs> sessions means but in terms of surveys unfortunately because we are only a small team 
and we cover the whole of Devon, we can't come out and do sort of individual surveys with with each church, unfortunately. But if you get in touch with us, we can signpost you to uh, resources and things that will help you do those surveys. Um, and I think, you know, do do things like, you know, put shout out in your you know local magazines or parish magazine uh, and ask if there's anyone willing, you know, with those ID skills um, to, to come and help and, you know, volunteer their time for you. Um, it is about reaching out into your community and, um, yeah, see, seeing what what skills are already within your reach, if that makes sense. Um, so, so yeah, unfortunately, we can't do individual survey sessions, although we'd love to. We we, <laughs> we just don't have the capacity. Um, Katie, could another quick in here? Could I just chip in on that one very quickly? Yeah, um, yeah. Our team used with um, some success the Field Studies Council guides. Yes. And they're absolutely excellent because they're weatherproof and they're really good, whether you're a sort of expert, a partial expert or a, or a complete beginner. Uh, and they're yeah. really, um, you know, really useful um, for uh, uh, field guides. Lots of yeah, no, that, that's space. exactly the kind of thing that we would um, yeah, signpost people to. You know, the, the FSC guides are you know, excellent, like you say. They're not too daunting, are they? It's not like picking up a... A thick book and going oh where do I start they're they're really just really accessible so yeah definitely a top tip um any other questions that have come through um oh someone's just said a good Devon source for wildflower mix mix is Goran Farm in East Devon near Stockland mm. so there we go um and another one here, can David provide more detail separately about notice board sources and when he might get his bulk buyer projects off the ground? Put me on the mailing list, that person says. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, David. I've been doing Living Church Arts for about 25 years now and at the beginning of that time, I worked with a, a very um, well-known sign-making company, which does all the signs, way markers for national parks and everything else. And um, so I'm negotiating with them. Again, each individual board is very expensive. It's three to 500 quid, but you get what you, know, you, get what you might you pay for. And, um, and I don't expect churches to be able to afford that. So I want to be able to buy 10, 15 in bulk at a cheaper rate, of course, and then actually give them to the churches to do that. So that is ongoing at this moment. At this moment. Yeah. Does um, anyone else have any more questions? Just aware of the of the time, we just sort of come into the to the end of the session. Hetty, have you had anything come through to you? Yeah. So I've got one um, kind of building of what on what you were talking about earlier, actually, um, just about what permissions and maybe even sort of safety considerations would you need um, for taking action at your local church? So maybe if you want to say about um, that first, David, and maybe um, Caroline and Charlotte, if you want to say what experience you've had with what permission you might need to get. Yes. Um, you get your permission from, you know, go to your church warden first, and then they'll put it to the PCC and to give you permission, but a churchyard is a public open space, okay? So you really don't need permission to go in there and do bird recordings, plant recordings, anything like that. It's a public open space. It would be good if you got a group together to do a risk assessment. I know those are a bit of a nuisance to some people, but I find them very, very valuable. So before you go into a churchyard, do a risk assessment. If you can't cope with that, then get hold of me and I will write one for you. In fact, I think I've already done it. So um, I can supply you with a risk assessment for working in a churchyard, if that's necessary. Um, yeah, there are the main issue in churchyards, and I nearly became a proper in one of the churches, is that if you've got a... Um, gravestones, curbstones, which are overgrown, and you trip over one, there is no soft landing, because the next thing <laughs> you land on is the next gravestone. 
and I nearly became a <laughs> cropper um, with that. So walking through churchyards is extremely dangerous. You have to be very careful. Yeah, I think I think um, we 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 would add to that too that it is, and it's it's sort of made doing things with uh, lots of children problematic, doing things with the elderly problematic. Uh, we've had these uh, three big ash pollarded, um, and we've been kind of clearing the wood chip and so on, helping the PCC with that recently. Um, and of course, the uh, the guys who cut the fell the trees did very well. But uh, nevertheless, some of the unfortunately, once some of the greystones have fallen, and I was fearful that some others may be slightly loose as well. <coughs> um, so working in amongst that, again, um, a, a risk assessment would be a pretty good idea and quite important. Uh, you don't want a gravestone falling falling on you which in some churchyards, uh, I know some of them have had them, many of them removed in the city centre locations uh, for, because of the risk of, of graves falling. Um, I don't know if, if I had experience of that at all, David. One child was killed about three years ago. Really? And that sent, <laughs> it sent yeah. vibrations throughout the whole of the country, as you can imagine. Yeah, and the, yeah. the, the CME demanded that a survey be done of every gravestone. You literally stand on the button and go like that. Uh, and if it rocks, you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm. Well, well then it, yeah, that's, it's definitely a, a serious con consideration then, isn't it? When you're, yes. you know, yes. thinking of working in your local church, churchyard mm -hmm. and burial ground. Mm. Okay, is there any more questions from, the audience, as it were. <laughs> Just raise your hand or unmute yourself. No? Okay, well, I'm sure you have an evening to, to be getting on with. Um, but just before you go, there's just a um, poll question uh, that I'd like you to, to fill out again. Um, thank you once again to our speakers, um, Charlotte and David and Caroline joining in on the on the Q and A as well from from Modbury, really useful. I hope you've all found it, um, you know, a useful session. Please do feel free to get in contact uh, with the Wilder Communities team um, if you have any further questions uh, or would like to get in contact with with people uh, like uh, Caroline and Charlotte and David. Uh, our email address is wildercommunities at devonwildlifetrust.org. Um, we've also got a feedback form that we've just popped into the chat. We'd really, really uh, appreciate you feeding back about this session, as well as the poll question on, on the, that's just popped up. I know that's a lot of questions, but um, it really does help us um, to improve things going forward for, for people like yourself. So we really appreciate it. So I can see that you filled out the, the poll. So do you now feel more inspired, able or confident to welcome wildlife into churchyards uh, or burial grounds? And yeah, a number of you feel a lot more inspired. A few of you feel little uh, and one person doesn't feel able at all. So, but that's that's all good. That's why we have this feedback so we can, we can understand how helpful these sessions have, have been. Thank you everyone once again the link for the feedback form is in the chat um and i hope you all have a have a good evening <laughs>